clean up your language. Um, not that I care. Actually. Um, okay, uh, we're, we're here. Um, this is Conversations With, and uh, tonight we're going to be talking baseball, and, and we might get to some other sports as well. And um, just a, a word, this is uh, sponsored by the New York Writers Workshop. So if you're, you know, if you want, go there um, and you can like the page or whatever. Uh, and then you can see a lot more of these things. This is the fourth one. Um, Reed Farrell Coleman is a repeater. He's been on with me before. And Reed is, um, is a crime writer, uh, a best-selling crime writer. And um, he'll talk a little about that uh, later. Um, but um, he uh, he has a lot more. He's done a lot more than that. You know, drive an oil truck, work at uh, you know at, at, uh, at JFK baggage handler, which is um, if you want to know what it was like after you go watch um, Goodfellas, Reed will tell you. We give that line because I, I love that line about you know t Tuesday and Thursday or whatever. Unmute yourself though. Read unmute. unmute. If, it fell, if it fell off the truck on Tuesday, we were wearing it on Thursday. <laughs> um, anyway, um, on my screen next to him is um, Ralph Carhart, and I'm going to read a little bit of their bios. Um, is a Brooklyn-based theater director and manager, and a baseball historian. He is the head of the Society for American Baseball Research, um, which is um, Saber, and um, he's the winner of the Saber. 19th Century Committee's 2015 Chairman's Award. That sounds like the fix was in. You're in the organization and you gave yourself uh, um, I, I, See, I'm not the head of Sabre though. I'm the head of, the, uh, of their grave. Oh, still part of them. Okay, we'll, we'll let that slide. I've always thought that what I, we all should do is make up awards and then just give it to ourselves. And who's gonna know the difference? Um, <laughs> Anyway, he's got a, a, a new book out, which is called um, Paul Ball, and um, he's going to talk about that. It's, it's let's, Let me see if I get the whole title. Um, Paul Ball, um, give the whole title, Ralph. What's the whole title? The Hall Ball, One Fan's Journey to Unite Cooperstown Immortals with a Single Baseball. Pretty good. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that a little later. Um, then I've got... Um, Roberta Newman, and she has a really long, first of all, she's got a, a doctorate uh, and she teaches at NYU, correct? Um, yep. And um, she is obviously really interested in baseball, and we'll get to, to why. She's mm -hmm. one of the author of Here's the Pitch, The Amazing, True, New, and Improved Story of Baseball and Advertising, which is fascinating. And you've also written a lot about the Negro Leagues. Yes, yes. Um, you know, it's funny. I'm going to give a quick digression. Is um, people, you know, if you say Negro leagues now or colored leagues or whatever, everyone sort of gets their back up. But when I did my basketball book um, years ago, um, the editor called up and said, "You have you have uh, some of these players calling it the colored leagues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, maybe we should change that." So I knew that that shouldn't. But uh, a player by the name of Cal Sanders, uh, Cal Ramsey was in the book and he's mm -hmm. he was black and I called him up and said, hell no, that's what we call them, you know, it's the Negro Leagues or the Black Leagues. Um, huh? And um, next and um, last but far from from least is Richard Neer, um, who has eight crime novels that he's published and we'll let him talk about one that he wants to choose to, to talk about at the end. Um, he's uh, also written the definitive history of FM radio, uh, FM, the rise and fall of rock radio. Um, Richard, did you know my friend Joe Mater, the, the rock and roll madam? Joe Mater, indeed yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, she's a, a good friend of mine. Um, and then he's, the reason he's here, other than being a great guy, and he had me on his show, um, is that he's got an extremely popular sports show, Weekends on WFAN, uh, which is um, 101.9, and then at 6.60 a.m. Uh, on the a.m. Uh, and, um, okay, I want to get right into this. And if you have questions, just write them, and um, we'll try to answer them. Uh, I thought I'd start with a, a really simple question, which is, um, what's your first memory of baseball, either playing it 
or watching it or can you remember the first time you thought of it? Let's start with you, Roberta. Well, um, actually, I grew up in Brooklyn and I really wasn't all that interested. My father stopped watching baseball, even though he was a Yankees fan when the Dodgers left because it just annoyed him. Um, but I was always a contrarian. And so when the Mets won in 69 and everybody went around cheering, etc., I announced that I was a Yankees fan. From then, I had just because nobody was, and it was totally uncool. So I've had to back that up over the years. Um, that's so, primarily so, that, and I can't play. Uh, okay. Uh, Rick, did you remember the first brush you had with baseball, either playing it or, or as a fan? I was in Little League, and I played in Little League, and we were uh, up in Syracuse, and we had uh, Star Plate was the name of the uh, thing on our jerseys, and I didn't know whether that was a plate glass company or we were stars at the plate or whatever, and I was the guy that played right field. You know, remember when you were a kid and you played baseball? They'd always put the kid with no talent in right field because nobody, you didn't have a lot of left-handed hitters and they didn't hit the ball over there. So I played right field and I got up in the last game and bases were loaded and we were down by two runs and the pitcher was wild throwing these fastballs over my head and everywhere. Finally, I said, you know what, I'm going to, hit this wherever it's pitched. It was on the ground, about six inches of ground, above the ground, on the outside part of the plate. I swung as hard as I could, hit it over the fence in right field, grand slam, we won the game, and I was hooked. That, that's great. You know something, um, you, are, you and people like you are the reason that I learned as a, as a righty and a natural pole hitter, I learned how to go to right field because of people like you. Because when growing up, as you say, the, 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 usually the weakest player um, was in right field. Um, Reed, how about you? What's your first uh, memory? Uh, well, I, I, I played Little League as well, uh, but really my what got me into baseball was the fact that we used to have catches. I'm the youngest of three sons, and my dad was also allegedly a minor league catcher in the Dodgers system. Like, But I, that's when the Dodgers had, and the minor leagues had, Class A, Class B, Class C. My dad was like in a Class D Brooklyn Dodger uh, catcher. And we used to have catches out in front of the house on, and on the block with my brothers and my dad. And so that's kind of my introduction to baseball was through my family, uh, you know. And was your family Brooklyn uh, Dodger fan because, because oh, of yeah. Brooklyn? My, yeah. My my grandmother used to write letters. My dad's mom used to write letters to Branch Rickey, giving him advice about how to. I, but I'm the only Coleman brother that didn't get to go to Ebbets Field because I was born the year before they moved. Ah, um, you know, one of my favorite Branch Rickey um, stories is, as I did for a book that I, I wrote, is that um, he was, he was uh, the general manager at the time of, of Pittsburgh Pirates in the early 50s. And Ralph Kiner was on that. It was a horrible team. It made our book as one of the worst teams of the century. And Kiner was on it, and he was a home run hitter, and he won the, the home run uh, crown for the year. And he went to, um, to Ricky for a raise. And Ricky said, look, we came in last place with you. We can come in last place without you. And needless to say, he did not get the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the raise. Uh, how about you, Ralph? What was your first uh, memory of, of baseball? The, the first memory I have is uh, Reggie Jackson's three home runs in the 1977 World Series. Those, um, you know, I, I was, my father was a Yankee fan. So I was a Yankee fan at that point in my life because I was five at the time. Um, mm -hmm. So we watched that World Series together on television. And I, I have a very distinct memory of, of Reggie hitting those three home runs. And after that, I was, I was convinced that not only the Yankees, but Reggie Jackson were capable of anything. I just figured Reggie got a home run every time he got up to bat. Um, and I, you know, I was, yeah, five, I was five at the time. So little league followed not long after that. And, um, 
and and I was hooked until uh, 1994. I took a hiatus. I have to be honest. I, I left baseball um, for a few years after the strike. I wasn't as interested in it. I had a, a change in my life and 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 got away from it. Um, and then in 1999, I uh, was I was working down in New York City. I was working for Calvin Klein. And the owner of Calvin Klein, which is not Calvin Klein, but a, a guy by the name of Barry Schwartz, um, had a box at Yankee Stadium, and he was giving away the tickets. And I, I had never been to Yankee Stadium. I, 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 not long after, funny enough, even though Reggie and the Yankees are what brought me in, um, I quickly became a Mets fan uh, just because I've always rooted for the underdog. Um, so I'd never gone to Yankee Stadium. I'd only gone to Shea. Uh, and I, I figured I'd go. I'd check out Yankee Stadium um, you know, this one time. And that night was sort of a transformational experience in part because Barry Schwartz's tickets are front row right next to third base. Willie Randolph was five feet away from me coaching third base. Um, so it was, it was a, a, you know, an epiphonic experience. And uh, since 1999, I've uh, immersed myself, not just in, in watching the game and, and what's happening right now, but, but in the history as well. So it's, it's interesting for a Mets fan like myself that it was two experiences with the Yankees that, that made me what I am today, but that is the truth. Yeah, I, I, I grew up being first um, a Dodger fan. Uh, I was very young when they, when they left. And once they left, uh, it was over for me, I mean, with the Dodgers. And for some reason, I became a Pittsburgh Pirate fan. And I think the reason was um, Roberto Clemente, who was my favorite player, um, because not that he was so good, but he was unorthodox. You know, if, if you looked at his swing, his swing wasn't really good. He did have a rifle arm. Um, but what I think we, we should deal with the, um, the elephant in the room really quickly. So I'd like to go around and see what you think about this season, whether whether you think it um, was a good idea to do it, whether it's being handled well, what are the odds that it will go the whole the whole way? So I want to, I want to start with a fan, a big fan, Reed, um, who calls into Richard's show all, all the time. Um, you know, he said, right, Richard? Um, Reed is calling in a lot to your show. Um, He's annoying, yes, he is. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah. Reed, tell us what you think about the whole the season and the setup. And Well, whatever. you know, I can't blame them for play, trying to play the season. There's a lot of money at stake. Um, and, you know, they're playing it by ear. We're all playing life by ear now. And so uh, I, I am loath to criticize the, the lords of baseball for trying to get the season in. I, I still can't stand the, the fact that they, even though Donald Fear isn't there anymore, that the, somehow the owners and the players have such animus for each other, I, that that drives me a little mad. Um, but you know, the bottom line is they're humans, and so it's it's kind of nuts what they're trying to do. You know, a team plays two games and then they don't play for ten days. Right? You know, and and so everybody's playing it by ear. And as a fan, I'm kind of watching it by ear. Except the problem is I'm a Mets fan, and so. You know, it's 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 like being cursed. That's right. So. That's right. I, I'll tell you who's really hurting is uh, people who, who started their fantasy baseball league because guys are dropping, you know, in and out all the time, you know, quitting in the middle, like cess for this. Uh, I'm not going to call on people now, but who, if you have something to say about this, just, let, you know, start talking. If you have something about that question, anyone. Uh, I mean, I personally, I, I think this season's a mistake, especially the way they've structured it with all of the travel. I mean, I think, you know, there are, as Reed says, there's a lot of unknowns and, and, and variables out there and we're all just kind of winging it. But I think one of the things that's sort of universally accepted is that the, the more humanity spreads, the more the virus is going to spread, right? So by, by creating a baseball season where they're traveling almost as much as they normally would be. They're not, you know, they're not making the West Coast trips and stuff like that. They're, they're, they're at least avoiding that, but you're still seeing a phenomenal amount of travel and it's putting all of them in, an, in a very precarious position. And we've seen it with the Marlins and now we're seeing it with the Cardinals. And, you know, chances are in another week, we're gonna see it with another team. And, it, and it's, it, it's unfortunate because, you know, as Reed says, it, it's all being motivated by money, right? So the owners are making it 
out to be the players' problems. When when the Marlins all fell apart, they were very quick to make sure everyone knew it was because the players went and did something they shouldn't have done. Well, now they've got a situation where the Cardinals apparently followed all of the protocols, and yet still there it is. Um, so it's it, it doesn't really seem to be that they have created a situation that's safe enough. And I, I don't know if they could have done something like the NBA, NBA is doing, where they created that bubble um, and, and, you know, it's a slightly safer situation because of no travel. Um, but the fact is that they didn't, and the plan that they've presented and they are implementing is proving to be hazardous to the player's health. And, you know, it's, it's difficult to just listen to a ball game and not a feel a little bit like you're not sitting in the Coliseum, right? Like you're just watching these guys risk their lives for my entertainment. Um, <laughs> uh, Richard, because you're, you know, you're in the thick of it because your show, uh, what do you think? I, I think they had to try. I know they wanted to do a bubble initially. They were talking about Texas and Arizona and Florida. And unfortunately, as this virus emerged, those became hot spots when they weren't so much in the very beginning. It was New York. It was the Northeast. So, and I think um, Reed put his finger on it, the animosity between the players and the owners. They could have maybe done it in three or four different cities, but the players were like, well, we don't want to be away from our families for that long. Um, and even though the NBA is doing it, it's a playoff system. So there'll be 16 teams and there'll be eight teams and there'll be four teams. So it really won't be a long absence. Whereas baseball, you could be there for two months with the 60 games, then another month with the playoffs. So you'd be away from people for a long, long time. I think they did the best they could. Uh, I think they anticipated that there would be problems, that the virus would spread. But I think no matter what they did, you know, people were going to get sick. And I applaud them for trying. I applaud them for coming up with all the protocols. But you're dealing with guys in their 20s and 30s, and you know what they're like. They want to go out. They want to drink. They want to be women. You know, this was bound to happen. Um, Richard, uh, if you had to give odds, would you give odds about this, the season actually going all the way through the way they plan it? Um, or you'd rather not? Well, I would say 73-37. No, I, I think the season finished uh, limping toward the end. I think there will be teams like the Cardinals, the Marlins, maybe others that we don't know about yet, who will not play 60 games. And they'll have to seed it through winning percentage. And there's going to be a lot of inequities. There are going to be teams that win, maybe even the World Series this year, who really shouldn't have because they didn't have a good regular season record. Right. It seems to me that it's a, it's a, a little bit like um, exhibition baseball. Um, how about you, Roberta? Do you have any feelings one way or the other about, about Yeah, I have, I have feelings one way and the other. Okay. Um, I'm stealing that line. <laughs> I, have it. Um, I think it's a mistake. I think it's uh, endangering the players and the staff. We have to remember it's not just them. It's the people who work with the team, the the photographers, etc., cetera. Um, broadcasters as well, home broadcasters. But on the other hand, I also understand why they're doing it. Um, I too applaud them for doing it. Um, I'm enjoying it. I'm trying to um, listen to or watch as many games as I possibly can because I have a sense that they may not finish. And anyway, it's filling, it's filling that COVID hole. Um, one thing that concerns me, though, is the new rules that have been put into place. I don't ever see them going back, Major League Baseball going back. I think you've seen the end of pitchers hitting. Um, and I'm going to not make any friends here, but I don't mind that. I'm okay with the designated hitter. What can I say? Oh. Oh. You know, oh. This is how ridiculous oh. it was. They were considering, I believe, at least I read this, Richard might know because he's probably more tuned in, of starting what would be the, the ninth inning with a runner on second or something like that. I mean, no, that's no, it's the extra innings. Extra. In the extra innings, each team starts 
with the either the guy who made out the previous inning, the last out is on second or a pinch runner on mm-hmm. second base. It, so it, you start the inning like that. Right. The, it, that's like elementary school. It's not baseball to me. Well, it's it is now. That though was a concession they made to the virus because they did not want long games, and they also knew they'd have to jam a lot of games into a short period of time. So I agree with Roberta. Meaning double headers. Yeah, about what? I, I, I agree. About I, agree with, I agree with Roberta that some of the rules will not disappear. Mm-hmm. The DH is here to stay. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, I, I think the DH is here to stay. I don't think the runner on second base will stay. I think that's a con- as Richard said, I think that's a concession to the virus. Mm-hmm. And I don't think seven inning double headers will stay. Mm-hmm. And there's one rule which I really hope doesn't stay, which is the three batters. You have to face three batters mm-hmm. pitching rule. Both well, the runner, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, Roberta. Go ahead. So both the runner on second and the three um batters, the three batters was in place before COVID. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And also I've been hearing about the runner on second for about two years now. And I know that um John Thorne. You know, that. That's Joe Torrey's idea. Yeah. Oh, God. I know that John Thorne, the official historian of Major right. League Baseball, um, did say that a lot of um, changes were going to be coming and that we probably, we baseball scholars, baseball serious fans, were not going to like them. And I suspect that runner on the runner on second was one of them, but the three batters was already in place. Yeah, uh, Ralph, you were going to say something about that. Uh, I, I, exactly what Roberta was going to say about the three batters. That one was supposed to happen this year already, anyway. That, that was really, a time thing. Right? They didn't want changing pitchers. Like right, it, uh, and, and, and honestly, I, I that one doesn't bother me. The one the runner on second base bothers me. Seven inning double headers bother me, but the the three batters one doesn't bother bother me that much, quite frankly. Especially, you are clearly not a left handed pitching specialist. I, I, I get that, and I get how that's going to complicate things for them. I really do. But I, 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 you know. I'm not a person who thinks baseball games are too long, right? That's what the whole three batter thing was supposed to address is that a baseball game is too long. Uh, I don't I, I will happily watch a five hour baseball game as long as an hour and a half of that isn't them changing a pitcher after every single batter, which is what it becomes in September when you expand those rosters and you've got a playoff hunt. You're looking at a game where the ninth inning takes two and a half hours. That's not as interesting. But, but that, that then there's an easier way to change that than artificially placing you have to pitch the three batters. And that is, which is a, be, a much better idea, you can expand your, your September roster, but you make it like a taxi squad. So you can expand and bring guys up. But each game, you can only have five extra players play. So you don't have unlimited lefty-righty switches. So you don't have to have this artificial rule about how many people you have to pitch to. You just can't have endless pitchers. Mm -hmm. See, I think the problem, and I'm going to point right at you, Ralph, Uh, (laughs) metric, uh, uh, advanced analytics, and I think the unfortunate, unintended consequence of that is that you figured out that launch angle, you want to hit home runs. It's much more efficient to score runs that way. So you're seeing more home runs, but you're seeing more strikeouts. You're seeing more walks. You're seeing the ball in play less. Now, that may be a more efficient way to play the game and to win the game, which, as Mr. Edwards said, is why you play. But it also makes a much more boring game, I think. Yeah, that's the great challenge is that we, you know, and and keep in mind, you know, I'll take the hit for Saber, but but keep in mind, I'm the historian half of Saber, not the statistics half of Saber. That's not my jam as much. Um, But, you know, what what we have learned is as as a result of this is that um, essentially what you said, that the the most successful way to play baseball, if the point of the game is to win, 
the most successful way to play baseball is not actually necessarily the most entertaining mm -hmm. product to watch. Um, and, and so now we've created this very bizarre um, dynamic where, you know, we want our teams to do everything they can to win, but now it's creating a, a product that's not as entertaining. So now what do we do? Yeah, you know, now we are going to have to start looking for one of the, the rules. One of the, you can limitations on things. one of the persons you can blame for a lot of this is uh, Tony La Russa, who, who really started this whole thing. Or he may not have started it, but he certainly popularized it, uh, like changing pitchers all the time, having specialty pitchers. Um, and I actually had some, uh, you know, I talked to him, and he was a lawyer. So he, you know, he was that kind of guy. But one of the things that, that, bothers me is um, is stuff like that is tinkering with stuff um, to, to, to have a, a result of the game like when they raised the the mound was it a few inches or just anyone they, they lowered, lowered the mound, the mound. They lowered, they the mound. lowered the mound and that was the year I think Bob Gibson was almost unhittable but they, they did that for a reason and when they when they juice up the ball or whatever so I just have a problem just play the damn game is, is stop tinkering with it and this is going to, I'm going to go right to you because a lot of it has to do, I'm sure, with getting people to watch, which means advertising. Mm -hmm. So yes. a little about, about <laughs> the specialty there, um, Roberta, because it's fascinating to me. Well, I'm um, like Ralph, a devoted member of Sabre on the historian side. And what I noticed was no one was writing about advertising and baseball and nobody had actually done it. And so what I'm interested in is what the advertising means, how the advertising along with the game and where they meet reflects what's going on in the United States at the, at the same time. But I, I do have to say, I've been paying attention to the marketing of the game. And I think the thing we have to remember and it's behind the tinkering, is that baseball, as much as we hold it semi-sacred or sacred, is part of the entertainment industry. And they're having trouble drawing younger fans. I don't think some of the things they're doing uh, prior to COVID, some of the things they've been doing to try to attract younger fans just don't make sense and it doesn't work. The loud, why do they think that young baseball fans, people who might be interested, must hear noise the whole time? I sit there with young fans who don't care for it. Um, there are a lot, of, a lot of things that baseball's trying to attract people to the game because without viewers, there's no reason for this industry. And it is an industry and we have to remember it. And, and players are entertainers. We have to remember that. Um, and I think we tend to lose sight of that as we, as we watch, that this is part of the entertainment industry, first and foremost. Well, yeah, but, but in the entertainment industry, and I know they do it in publishing, they do studies before they do things. Mm -hmm. And, and what I find is if you examine a lot of the things that baseball does, my kids are not going to watch baseball. They can do every one of these things, and my kids aren't going to watch baseball. They're not interested in baseball. So in some ways, I find what baseball is doing is both alienating fans like us. The loud. I go to a Met game, and I come away deaf, and I can't. It's horrible. I mean, what would it kill them to have some quiet between the innings, right? No, there's always some hebrephrenic contest. You know, uh, the subway trains, the hat contest, the music, that's yeah. so loud, it's crazy. So um, that's not going to make my, you know, 28 and 31-year-old kids like baseball. Like, who thinks that's a good idea? And on the other hand, it alienates older fans like me. I'd rather watch a baseball game at home. Well, part of the problem is, when you, guys know this, when you do research, there are so many different variables. And if you do research and you say, hey, kids, what do you like? Music. I like hip hop. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Kids like hip hop. Let's get hip hop in the game. Well, 
What about the people who are already there who just can't stand hip hop, who are turned off by it? So I think the research that they are doing, and they are doing a lot of research, is, is very flawed in its methodology and it's aimed at the wrong people. And unfortunately, people our age, they don't care about because they know we love the game. We're going to stay with it pretty much no matter what. And, you know, we'll put up with the noise. We'll put up with all the other stuff because we're hooked. Whereas they're trying to draw in those younger people. And I, I think it might be a fool's errand, really. You know, um, Reed has a, um, I, I'm going to take it from, he has a feature on Facebook, you know, Get Off My Lawn, where he will, you know, he'll do a lot of things. He'll, he'll, you know, give reviews or whatever. But if something pisses him off, and I know this is, this had to come, but I'm sure most of us remember, maybe not all, because some are younger than others, when ball games and the World Series was during the day. I mean, I remember being in school and, you know, having the little radio and hiding and listening to, to it. And when you when you start those games at 8:30 or other game, and um, the tickets are really expensive to go to the games. So if a if a father wants to take two kids, you know, by the time he's finished, it's, it could be a few hundred dollars depending on the seats. So I mean, I, I think it's not a, an easily answered question. I think all these things go into it, and and I agree with you, Reed. I I don't think whatever they do, they they're not going to get it back. Um, well, but ahead, one Bob. of the one of the fundamental things that that is killing the the future fan base and it, it again it does come down to money is you know we all just talked about how we fell in love with baseball and we fell in love with it by playing little league um but now if a kid shows any propensity towards or towards the game whatsoever in little league they now to have any chance to pursue that that elusive dream to become a professional baseball player it's on to you know the traveling teams and those organized teams um that that they're pumping kids into these days that are phenomenally expensive thousands of dollars and that is prohibitive from kids being able to really explore their baseball talents, that that fact alone, and and beyond the fact that it does cost a family of four, four hundred dollars to go see a major league baseball game this day. You know, I have a, a friend who has two kids who play baseball, and mm -hmm. you're absolutely right, Ralph. And he's following them all over because you know they're traveling, you know, and, and they have to get uh, some some of them have their own coaches, like for the you know mm -hmm. for SAT and stuff like that. And I know, and I want to get back to, to you, Roberta, for a minute. I know. Advertising is nothing new. I mean, I remember the old Ebbets Field had a you know, um, you know, hit hit sign win suit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so they, it's and they always had advertising around. Mm -hmm. but had, in your mind, has it gone overboard? Has it helped the game or hurt the game? Um, I think if you go back to the beginning, it's always been there and it's always been um, intrusive. But we look at some of the older advertising with nostalgia. I mean, I've heard people complain about the AT&T call to the bullpen, for example. But what about the old Goldie, right? In, in Ebbets Field, I believe it was. Um, if when Old Gold was the sponsor and later post Toasties, if, uh, if a Dodger hit a home run, um, a carton of cigarettes or a box of cereal was lowered down into the dugout. There was a person whose partial job it was to do that. That is no different than the AT&T call to the bullpen. What, what's very odd, though, is if you look at baseball games from the 60s, mm -hmm. 70s, and 80s, and you look at the stadium walls, they were bereft of advertising. Mm -hmm. Like, you um, look, go look at Shea, and the, the walls were, you know, was really very little advertising. Now, um, and it doesn't bother me. I mean, frankly, it doesn't bother me. I ignore it, too. You're right. And, right. And you look uh, at Old Evans Field, there were ads all over the place. There were ads right. everywhere. Sorry. If you go back to the 19th century, there's not a place in photographs of old ballparks, that uh, professional ballparks that don't have some sort of advertising on them. Look, we wouldn't have baseball on the radio, uh, or we wouldn't have, we still do if it weren't for advertising. You know, if it weren't for General Mills, um, 
you wouldn't have had the proliferation of baseball on the radio. Um, and if it wasn't for advertising, you wouldn't have had it on, certainly on television. And I think that also explains why you have the um, late starts, which are, which are silly. It's not just it's not just children. Look, I've taken my children. I took my children to World Series games or World Series game to playoff games that started at eight thirty, and I did not care what time they got home. They could skip a day of school to go to the playoffs. But well, speaking of advertising on the radio, yeah. Okay. Um, I I probably giving secrets out of school here, but uh, our radio station loses approximately $5 million a year having the Yankees on. Mm -hmm. uh, the rights fees that the teams charge, and the Mets are the same in every other team, are so high, but that's why you hear the AT&T call to the bullpen. That's mm -hmm. why you hear the time and temperature at the beginning of the game is sponsored. Everything is sponsored, and... I'm, I, you know, that, that horse has left the barn, unfortunately. And I think mm -hmm. if, if Major League Baseball said, okay, we're going to lower the rights fees, the radio stations would still do it because they're in business to make money. TV would do it. I mean, the, the one good thing I think they did with this season is they did shorten the commercial time between innings. Mm -hmm. It was 2.15. Now I think it's 2.05 or something like that. I mean, a little bit, but at least it's a step in that direction. Mm -hmm. I think a major problem with baseball is when I was grew up. Of course, now I sound like get off my lawn. But when okay. I grew up, when I grew up watching baseball, the greatest players were African Americans. There was a mix of players, but Willie Mays was the best player I, I've ever seen. And um, Hank Aaron, and you know Hank Aaron. I mean, the, the, the Hank Aaron. There was a mix. There was a real integration in baseball of mm -hmm. African American, Hispanic, and white ball players, and it was really interesting. And also, I think baseball has a real problem with. I bet you, if you put a picture up, not one person in the audience, other than a New Jerseyan or an Angels fan, would recognize Mike Trout. He's the biggest star in the game, and no one would know who he is. You football players wear helmets, and you know who they are. You know who Tom Brady is. You know who certain players are. Baseball has never marketed modern baseball their stars very well. Uh, I want to interrupt uh, for, and, and give another question because mm -hmm. my president, and I don't mean the guy in the White House, but Tim Tomlinson, has is what mm -hmm. I think is uh, um, a really good question, and that is I'd like to go around – and thought, actually two things, you know, uh, I forget who it was. It might have been Roger Angel who said, uh, in terms of writing, the smaller the ball, the better the writing mm -hmm. about it. But um, he, he would like to know what's your favorite baseball book. And then at the same time, I'd like to, to broaden it a little bit, your favorite any other sport book. Um, so why don't we start with um, Richard? What's your favorite baseball book? And then what's your favorite book about any sport? It's like, what's your favorite child? Um, I mean, I loved Ball Four. I read that in college, and that was like, what? Mickey Mantle? Uh, you know, all these guys that I had idolized and thought were just such clean, wonderful, living guys, I found out were kind of lecherous alcoholics, to be honest with you. Uh, so that kind of opened my eyes. But I loved Boys of Summer. There was a book out two years ago by Bob Clappish about the Yankee uh, season in 2017 that I thought was marvelous. I mean, there are just so many good books. A single out one I did not like, and that was one that got a lot of praise, The Art of Fielding. Did any of you guys read that? Oh, yeah, the novel. It was this great literary masterpiece about baseball, and I read it and I go, it's not about baseball. Uh, I didn't like it at all. Um, Ralph, we'll go to you. What, what's your, uh, and, and we will talk about, don't use your own book as, as the example. Oh, well, then never mind. You can skip me. No, um, yeah. my, uh, 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 you know, if we go, if we go, um, way back, uh, Lawrence Ritter's Glory of Their Times is, you know, a, 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 a seminal work, quite frankly. Um, uh, John Thorne's Baseball in the Garden of, of uh, uh, Baseball in the Garden of Eden is, um, uh, uh, an important work that, that was really influential on, 
uh, on me. And I actually just finished one recently, a recent book uh, by Eric Nussbaum called Stealing Home, which is the story of how the Dodgers moved to Los Angeles and, and the um, Mexican American community that was displaced to put the stadium there. And, um, you know, I, I have, uh, beyond baseball, I have certain political interests and, and to see a book that, that looked at baseball in that um, uh, frame of politics and, you know, uh, uh, was really powerful. It's, it's a really, really good book. And it, it's, it just came out a few months ago. It's new, but it's already in my top five. Yeah. Just so um, really Reed, how about you? You got a favorite baseball? Snow in August. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 have you ever read that? No. I think Pete, Ham I think Pete Hamill wrote it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's not strictly about baseball, but it is about baseball. It's about, uh, the relationship of a rabbi and a, an Irish kid and J Jackie Robinson and their love affair with Jackie Robinson in Brooklyn, since many of us here apparently have this love affair with Brooklyn as well. My favorite baseball record album, however. <laughs> Good one. Yes. So... When I uh, see you, you're going to have to play the entire album for me. Okay. Oh, no, no. You don't want to hear Art Shamsky's solo. <laughs> uh, Roberta, how about you? Do you have a favorite baseball album? Um, I, too, love Ball Four. But additionally, um, I guess it came out, it's more than 10 years ago, but I tend to think of it as a fairly new book because, well, I'm old. Um, I love The Echoing Green by Josh Prager. Um uh, Prager did investigative journalism, and he's the one who really uncovered the Giants' cheating scandal in 51. And it's so, it's such a beautiful book. I think it's one of the best sports books ever written, just from the point of view of sheer writing. Mm -hmm. um, Non, uh, Non-baseball books, I have a real favorite, which is um, Among the Thugs by Bill Buford, where he, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but Buford attempted to become a English football supporter and embed himself with a group of um, football thugs. I don't know. I don't know if that's the, well, it's a term he uses. And oh, yes. so, yeah, it's a, so it's a narrative of his season with a bunch of English football fans. It's fascinating. It's fun. Um, I recommend it highly. I'm going to mention too, I, I don't want, I'm going to, I, I don't want to sound like an egghead. But uh, I'm going to name one of the, the natural Bernard Malamud's. Uh, and it's not really just about baseball. And, mm -hmm. don't, and don't see the movie and think that you, you know, you, you know, read the book. But the other one, I'm sure no one here has heard of it. And I only know about it because I had to review it. But maybe someone does. It's a book called Small Town Heroes. And what it is, it's a, it's, it was a Canadian college professor who one summer went to as many on the East Coast and the Southeast Coast minor league games as he could in minor league stadiums and it's a brilliant book and the one thing i remember specifically is he went to one game and there was a guy who went it was a double header i think and he went something like uh, nine for ten and drove in 15 runs or some ridiculous amount and the writer says what it amounted to is he had a whole season in one night because or one day because he never he, you know, he probably batted 220 for the rest of the year. But it's, just, but it's a really fun book because you see how, and this is not anymore because there's very few minor league um, teams anymore, but how he'd go into these small towns and they would really um, support their minor league team. And, and a, lot of, a lot of the players were, were real characters. And I'll just tell one story that, um, that, that, that comes to mind. Anyone can comment it. I have a friend who was a, um, a sports agent for a while, and he had a one of his clients was a, a minor league pitcher, and he went down to see him pitch. And he's in the you know he's upstairs like in a tower where they watch the game, and he's watching intently. And in the in the room with him is Frank Robinson, and Frank Robinson and and the the sports agent's uh, client was a pitcher, and he was pitching, 
and uh, Robinson was, and he didn't seem to be paying attention at all. And suddenly the pitcher, his pitcher, gives up a home run. And suddenly um, Frank Robinson with laser-like you know, vision and concentration is watching the pitcher. So after the game, my friend uh, says to him, excuse me, uh, Mr. Robinson, you know, I noticed you weren't paying much attention. And then my kid gave up a home run and suddenly you wanted to, to you know, you were all, all eyes and ears. He said, because it's, it's important how he dealt with that home run that he gave up afterwards. That's what I was interested in. It didn't bother me that he gave up a home run, but what was he like afterwards? Um, did he lose concentration? Did he, you know, whatever. And so I found that a really interesting, and, and that's a real baseball guy, which, which Robinson was. It's, it's kind of tells you what it's like, and, and they, they watch the game differently. Um, okay, I, this is, I'm going to freelance this, but quick, like a lightning round, your best baseball movie, your favorite baseball movie. Um, Reed, you want to start? Uh, not really, because I don't really like baseball movies. Okay. I, think, right. I think they're mostly Trek. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fair. Um, Ralph, how about you? Okay. League of the Room. And uh, Roberta? Bull Durham. Okay. And Richard, you got one? I'm with you. Uh, None. <laughs> None of the above. I, I do want to mention, though, a writer that I forgot, and we really should uh, give her credit. Jane Levy has written yeah. The Last Boy, Mickey Mantle, wrote the recent book about Babe Ruth, and another book about Sandy Koufax. Mm -hmm. And I thought all those books were wonderfully researched and and compelling storytelling. I thought she did a great job on all three. I'm the, Babe Ruth one, the Babe Ruth one blew my mind because at mm -hmm. this point, how are there still new stories to tell about Babe Ruth? I mean, there's not a baseball player that's had more ink built about him than Babe Ruth, and yet she still found a way uh, to, to find things that we hadn't heard. That book in particular just was incredible. I love her stuff. Yeah, I mean, my favorite Babe Ruth is I, I, in this book that I did about the 10 worst teams of the century, um, I, I got um, the, the 1935 Boston Braves, which is where um, Ruth ended his career. It didn't even last the whole season. Although I think he hit a home run in his last at bat against Pittsburgh. But he always- He hit three that day. He hit three in his last game. His dream was always to manage um, the Yankees. The Yankees. And um, the owner of the Yankees was asked about it. Uh, and he said, he can't even manage himself. How could he manage the team? Uh, and I thought that was just a, a great line. Um, Roberta, do you have a movie that? Um, yeah, I said oh, Old Durham. Um, I, I love it. Uh, all right, Richard, I, I, I cannot let you go without some like odd stories from callers. Have you have like? Are there any stories that that um, that you can tell us that stand out about? Uh, and leave Reed out of it. But like wacky stories <laughs> or uh, any stories like that. Oh, uh, that's a tough oh. one. I mean, we we get cra I mean, there's one caller in particular I'll bring up. Hates Mike Trout, <laughs> and I know when he calls, he's going to tell me. Mike Trout shouldn't have won uh, most valuable player. Mike Trout, uh, you know, this guy hit more home runs and this other guy hit more RBI and this other guy uh, had a better slugging percentage. And I said, yeah. And all, of all three, though, uh, Trout did better than any of them. He had a, a higher plus in terms of uh, wins above replacement. He also can field and throw and do everything. And he played, well, yeah, but has he ever won a playoff game? And it's like, that's his fault. You know, that's a great, and, and a lot of fans use that as a criteria. How many how many championships does he have? Well, how many does Ernie Banks have or Ted Williams? Yeah, it's a really phony way of, of um, gauging success, I think. It's, it's, it's less prominent in baseball than in football. Mm -hmm. In football, you are judged by how many Super, Super Bowls Bowl. you've won. Yeah, right. Like Brady and Dan Marino, to me, Dan Marino was Dan Marino and, and Johnny Unitas were the greatest quarterbacks I, I've ever seen. But Dan Marino will never rank mm -hmm. quite highly because he never won a championship. Right, right. Um, Richard, I'm gonna, now I'm going to give give you all a chance to talk about your project. So, Richard, talk about uh, Ralph. Talk about your book that's out now because it's a fascinating concept. So, 
tell tell people what it is. Uh, well, the quick version is I uh, starting in 2010, I took a baseball that um, my wife fished out of the creek that runs next to Double Day Field in Cooperstown uh, to all of the members of the Baseball Hall of Fame, living and deceased. And I took a picture of them either holding the ball if they were still alive or the ball at their grave if they weren't. And the goal of the project when I was done uh, was to donate the baseball to the Hall of Fame. Um, that didn't pan out as I had hoped. Um, but well, you didn't want to take it, huh? Uh, they refused it. Yes. I, I, I donated it to them and, uh, they politely declined. Um, they, but in the end it found a much more appropriate home. I won't ruin the end for folks. I want them to go out and buy the book and read it. It was actually good that the hall of fame didn't take it. I, I found a much more appropriate home for it. Um, a, a place that, you know, understood my story a little better. My story is weird. It's a weird story, right? Like, you know, no one does this kind of thing. I'm, I understand I'm an odd guy with an odd passion for visiting cemeteries. How did you afford it? How did you afford Well, Joy Behar was a, a student of mine. She, she mm -hmm. jokes, but it's true. Her family holidays were going to um, cemeteries and they bring a picnic, you know, to see. I mean, that used to be, you know, back in, you know, the mid 19th century, that was what you did. That was, you know, Greenwood um, Cemetery in Brooklyn got as many visitors as Niagara Falls for a time, because that was what you did in the, in the mid 19th century, was you took the family to the cemetery and you had a picnic. Do you know how many um, miles you, you logged doing this? Uh, 27,000 driving and 27,000 in the air. Uh, and did your wife go with you for all or a lot of uh, A lot. Not all. There were some trips that she stayed behind. We have kids. They had school. Um, but but she went with me on a lot of them. We had a lot of family vacations over the eight and a half years it took me to finish the project that were based on where some dead baseball player was buried. So. And did you ever calculate how much it probably cost you to do this project? Uh, I, I, I knew there's no way what I, you have uh, for the book. Uh, I have a rough number. I have a rough number. Yes. And and the good news is because now the book is out, so I'll get a check for it. I can finally claim all those expenses on my taxes right. this year. So I'm super uh, excited about that. <laughs> we, we talk about the connection to baseball in um, your, you know. Well, um, I just, novel. just recently finished a six book stint writing Jesse Stone for the estate of Robert B. Parker. And some re readers who know Jesse Stone very well know that he was a minor league, the Dodgers triple A shortstop. And during a, a, a game in Pueblo, Colorado, uh, in the middle of a double play, he screwed up his shoulder and ruined his uh, baseball career. He was one phone call away from the Dodgers. So this, when I took over the series, I had to find a way into the character because he wasn't my character. And the way into the character I found was that eternal disappointment at being so close yet never getting there. And the first book I wrote, Blind Spot, Robert B. Parker's Blind Spot, um, it really explores a reunion of Jesse and his old uh, uh, Albuquerque teammates and Jesse's disappointment at, and so baseball, and when he meditates, Jesse takes a hard ball and pounds it into his glove. So that's like his praying the rosary is doing, that's how he concentrates. So those books are very intimately connected to baseball. Um, Roberta, talk about whatever project you've done that you'd like to talk about. Well, I've done, um, I have, only written two books, um, uh, but I'm the first one I'm really proud of. Almost no one's read it. Almost no one, uh, um, uh, except some members of the Saber Negro League committee, maybe. Um, but it deals with it, and it's co-authored. It deals with um, the business of black baseball. It, it deals with it in within the context of the community which provided the fan base. Because we noticed that other than Neil Langto, who wrote a, a brilliant book about the Negro Leagues, this seems to be overlooked in Negro League research to talk about the other businesses that the Negro Leagues were related to, hotels, restaurants, etc. And 
um, from my point of view, the um, businesses that advertised um, in the black press and in um, programs related to the Negro Leagues. And then um, my new book, as I said, my newer book is a cultural um, analysis of baseball and advertising. Um, I look I, I look at some, it's not uh, encyclopedic. I look at case studies, if you will. Um, my personal favorite is the chapter on direct-to-consumer um, pharmaceutical advertising, which I center around Rafael Palmero's Viagra mm -hmm. um, endorsement and Viagra's... Um, sponsorship of Major League Baseball. Uh, the fact that MLB.com had a fantasy game on it called um, something like uh, In the Clutch. Right? Advertising Viagra. When the, when the steroids wear off, take Viagra. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, Palmero probably needed it. Um, and uh, I also in, very much enjoyed uh, looking at um, Latino players and advertising and um, what I think of as the, or what I call the Chico Escuela factor, where um, Latino players are infantilized. And I think in advertising, and I think that big poppy really did a lot to counter that um, image. It's interesting that he uh, approved of the Chico Escuela, more recent for 21st century version on Saturday Night Live, but that's another issue. Um, so that's, that's what this book is about. And I'm just starting a new project. I'm going to look at baseball and comics. Oh. I think that's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, Richard, how about you? What do you work at? You know, you're a writer as well. You've got how many how many crime novels out? I've got uh, actually nine. I've got uh, eight Riley Kings and uh, one standalone. But um, Riley King played basketball for Georgetown. He was not a baseball I ask you if you had a tie in in your books to, to sports in any way. Um, well, you know, I, and I think Reed will back me up on this. Whenever I have trouble coming up with names for characters, because we always do, you know, oh, how am I going to name this guy? What, what's going to, especially when they're different ethnicities. Baseball is such a, a, a font of names. Uh, so I might change a letter of the name or I might change a different first name or something like that. But I always revert to using baseball players. And I generally have a scene in just about every novel where my guys are hanging out watching baseball huh. and arguing sometimes. They're Brave fans, they're Met fans. The love interest in uh, my books, Jamie Johansson, is a big uh, Mets fan. And uh, one of the other girlfriends is a big Atlanta Braves fan. So the Mets fans and the Brave fans always clash. So there's always that little insider baseball element. If you're in the baseball, you'll get the references. If you're not, you won't. Uh, give, a, give a title, a couple of titles so people can, can find them. Uh, well, your... Three Chords and the Truth is the standalone that came out in uh, February, and Brilliant Disguise is the brand new one, and that's about reality TV shows and how phony they are and how they're not real at all. They're just scripted or uh, the, the characters that are playing people that they aren't really in real life. So that's what this book is about. And uh, there's a murder on the set and there's a whole issue as to whether the guy on the, it's a husband and wife uh, renovating team and whether the husband killed the wife or the wife just disappeared for her own reasons. Uh, I'm going to ask Reed a question specifically, but anyone else, if they have an answer for it, because I know what a big Met fan he is, you know, maybe until now. But if you were the general manager, Reed, what would you do? Um, I would man? fire Brody Van Wagenen. Right. It's the first thing I would do. It was the dumbest. It was the dumbest hire I've ever seen. They had a guy, Chaim Bloom, who who ran a uh, who produced a great teams with no money in Tampa Bay, and he was on the he was. It was him and Brody Van Wagenen, and the Mets, as usual, picked the wrong guy. They mm -hmm. picked 
the flashy guy, the guy Jeff Wilpon could, you know, brag about and look, you know, as a big time agent. And the guy's done nothing but screw up since he made one good trade, J.D. Davis. And other than that, he's done. Okay, so if you were if you were the general manager, what would you would you? I, I totally agree with him. I, I thought it was I would, a good really what would what I would do is for for one thing, uh, Jimenez, their new new mm -hmm. player, who mm -hmm. looks like a guy who's been playing for twenty years. He's really. This is something the Mets never do: is bring up guys who actually look ready to major league ready. I, I Conforto might be the only other exception. There, there's very rarely. Sometimes they bring up pitchers, but they very rarely bring up position players. I would see at the end of the season what I could get for Rosario, because mm -hmm. their pitching staff is dead now. It's the Grom and and a lot of bullpen help, and not really much else. Um, so, anyone uh, want to that question, or, or for your favorite team? Does anyone else want to, a Met fan or another, you know, tell me what you would do if you were general manager of a team? Anyone? No. Okay. So I knew that that would be a really good question <laughs> for me. Um, you know, you get it off. It's just, but I, I agree. On. Yeah. Well, I agree with you. I mean, it was, to me, it was also a conflict of interest. You know, he he had um, he, he was the agent for a lot of these players. Um, so uh, even if he didn't need well, to, had a relationship. Just, just one thing I have to get say this quick. Look at the two things. The Yankees got DJ LeMayhu, a former batting champ, right? The guy can play every position in the infield, and they signed him for two years for $20 million. Brody Van Wagenen gets Jed Lowry, a guy yeah. who was his client, for two years, $24 million, right? He's older than LeMayhu, right? And the guy is going to wind up having played seven at-bats in two seasons. Yeah. This is who we – this is – I mean, that's – say no more. Right. Richard, I, I wanted to find out from you as, as kind of a final question. How did you get into uh, sports radio? Uh, is there a, a brief enough story that you can tell us about? about well, I, I went to Adelphi. I went up to the radio station thinking there's no way I'd ever get in here. And the guy said, uh, do you know anything about sports? I said, uh, yeah, I live for sports. I love sports. So he said – well, uh, at 11 o'clock tonight, we have a sports cast. Uh, do you think you could read it? Uh, yeah. So we had the old UPI machine, you know, the old ticker thing. And he said, all right, here's a copy. Read it. And that's how I got started uh, doing sports news, which evolved into being a disc jockey, which after that turned into being a sports talk host, which is what I really wanted to do all along. What, what year was that, that you, when you started as a sports radio? Uh, what year was that? Uh, I started uh, full-time in sports radio in 1987 uh, at a, a station called WNEW AM. 1130 on your dial, William B. Williams, Julius LaRosa, Steve Allen worked there, all these legendary people. And we were just transitioning to be a talk station. And uh, I did the 5 to 8 o'clock show called The Sports Connection with Rick Cerrone, who is now the editor of Baseball Digest. Um, and Richard was sort of winding up. By the way, no one mentioned my, I think my favorite baseball movie, which is Bad News Bears. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and fortunately, no one mentioned Bang the Drum Slowly. Uh, <laughs> in Houston, they call that Bang the Garbage Can Slowly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Richard, uh, you have another life. Just tell them what it is, the, the, you know, what else you do, your th theater. Talk about that a little bit. I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, yeah. oh, Ralph, uh, other oh, yeah. yeah, I work in theater. I've, uh, I actually work for Queens College for their Department of Drama, Theater, and Dance. That's, um, that's how I paid for all that travel uh, that I have to do is I've worked, uh, I've worked at Queens College for 14 years now. Um, and Roberta, do you want to um, say anything else? Did, did, did I... Anything else you want to get in about this subject or your life or whatever, uh, uh, tell them what you teach at NYU, too. Um, I, I do teach a, a class on um, global sports and cultural identity, um, but I primarily teach core humanities, mm -hmm. um, literature, art history, a little music, all in cultural context. 
and uh, the class I'm proudest of is a senior seminar on advertising, which I teach every semester. Okay, one quick lightning round and then we'll go. Richard, favorite player of all time? Hank Aaron. Okay, Ralph. Jackie Robinson. Okay, Reed. Willie Mays. Okay, Roberto. Yogi Berra. <laughs> You, you guys have been great. Uh, thank you so much. And you can take a look at the comments if you can see them. You have some friends here. Um, Arlene Zimmerman Rice says, Queen College, 1975. I don't know. It must mean something to someone. Uh, that's where I work. Oh, okay. <laughs> great. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Hang on a second. And um, and also, I'll tell you how you can you know send this around. Thanks. This was great. I could be gone much longer. Okay. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>